Graphs of rational functions. A rational function, r, in terms of x in our case, is a function that can be written as p of x, a polynomial, divided by q of x, another polynomial. And what's special about the rational functions is that in the denominator, q of x, the power of it has to be greater than or equal to 1. And the reasoning behind that is because if it was less than 1, say its exponent value or the degree was 0, it would just be a constant. And you wouldn't have a function of x over another function of x. In effect, a rational function is the quotient of two polynomials. And you take a polynomial and divide it by another polynomial to give you the rational function. The simplest rational function is the reciprocal function, which is 1 over x. It has a zero degree polynomial, the constant 1, and a first degree polynomial of x to the first power in the denominator. Notice in this recip reciprocal function, we have asymptotes being the y-axis and the x-axis. And as we perform transformations with this reciprocal function, we're going to move these two axes or this origin intersection point to the left, right, up, and down. And it doesn't really get much simpler than this. Let's review some other aspects of this function. As shown on the last slide, f of x equals 1 over x is that reciprocal function. And because we have division by 0 being undefined, the number 0 is not allowed in the domain. That's why the y-axis was a vertical asymptote in the original function. In set notation, we write the domain of f of x as x is contained in all real numbers without 0. And then to determine the range, it takes a little bit more thought because the range is impacted by the output values. And it's not as obvious when looking at the function what the output values will be. If we substitute 3 in for x, we end up getting that f of x is 1 third. And if we substitute 1 third in, 1 divided by 1 third is equal to 3. Similarly, the function evaluated at 1 fifth, 1 divided by 1 fifth will give us 5. And the function evaluated at 5 will give us 1 over 5. The function evaluated at negative 8 will be negative 1 eighth, and the function evaluated at negative 1 eighth will be 1 divided by negative 1 eighth, which would reduce to negative 8. In general, the reciprocal function has an interesting property. It's that f of a is equal to 1 over a, and this also implies that f of 1 over a is equal to a, meaning whatever value you substitute in for x, the output will be the reciprocal. So more in depth, how we ended up getting f of 1 fifth is by taking 1 and then substituting 1 fifth in for the denominator. And then in order to rationalize it, we're going to multiply both the numerator and denominator by 5. And this is allowed because you can multiply any number or expression by 1 and not change its value. And any number over itself is 1. 5 over 5 is 1. So we can see in the denominators, they cancel out, and we find out that f of 1 fifth is equal to 5, just as it says right here. Recall from algebra, especially in algebra 2, when we talk about rational functions, that the function f has a whole at x equals k for all values of k, where q of k is equal to 0 and p of k is equal to 0 provided the multiplicity of the factor x minus k in the numerator is greater than or equal to the multiplicity of the factor x minus k in the denominator. Now, what exactly does that mean, you may be asking? Well, if we notice in this first one, we see that we have x minus 2 appearing one time in both the numerator and denominator. So they will end up canceling each other out. Whatever value x is, if x is 1, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Those two negative 1s will cancel each other out. So the graph of this function resembles the function y equals x. The exception is wherever that pair of factors cancel out is going to be where a hole exists because you cannot have 0 
in the denominator of a rational function. And when you get 0 over 0, that usually means that you have a common factor that is not defined within that function. Now, when the multiplicity of x minus k is greater in the denominator, it will remain as a vertical asymptote. So in this one, you do have one pair of factors that cancel out, but now the simplified version of g of x is x divided by x minus 2 raised to the first power. So you still cannot substitute 2 in to this updated g of x function. You'll end up getting 2 over 0 for g of 2, which is still undefined. So that's why there's a vertical asymptote in this case. Therefore, when the degree of the factor, or common factor I should say, is greater in the denominator, an asymptote will still exist in the graph of the function, as shown and explained with the graph shown here to the left. A rational function has a vertical asymptote at x equals k for all values of k, where q of k, the denominator, is equal to 0, and p of k, the numerator, is not equal to 0. Now, based on the information that we've just discussed about rational functions and where the numerator and or denominator are equal to 0, many people imagine that all rational functions have domain restrictions that occur as vertical asymptotes or removable discontinuities, in other words, holes. Now, this is actually a misconception because any function that can be written as p of x over q of x is considered rational. Well, what if we had these functions? 1 over x squared plus 1. These are both still a p of x over q of x. But notice in this case, the denominator it's actually not possible for it to ever equal 0, because no matter what x value you put in there for x, when you square it, it becomes positive. So a positive plus 1 will always yield a real number. In this next example, we have that same denominator of x squared plus 1. It's never possible for this value to be 0, because again, whenever you are squaring it, Whatever the x value is, if it's negative 4, when you square it, you get 16. When you square positive 3, you get 9. 9 plus 1 is 10. Another example could be 2 over x to the 4th plus 4. Because whenever whatever you put in for x, when you have x to the 4th, it will always end up being a positive value. And then domains for functions such as f of x, g of x, and even this extra example is the set of all real numbers. Both are considered rational functions, and neither one of these, and this one also, none of them have domain restrictions. There are no vertical asymptotes and no holes in these special types of rational functions. Finding the range of a rational function is usually a bigger challenge than finding its domain. The domain, it's easy. All you have to do is set the denominator equal to zero and solve to figure out what value or values x cannot equal. But the range is a little bit more of a challenge. Let's begin with some easy to explain cases. If our rational function is equal to some constant k divided by ax plus b, where k is not 0, we know that the domain is going to be where ax plus b is not equal to 0. So if we subtract b to both sides, we'll get that ax is equal to negative b, and divide both sides by a, x cannot equal negative b over a. So therefore, the domain is that x is contained in all real numbers without the value of negative b over a. Now the range includes all y values with the exception of the x-axis or y equals 0. And why does that happen? It's because the original rational function looks like this, where the 
y-axis and x-axis are your asymptotes and you're simply moving it to the left or right and there's no up and down movement outside. So therefore, the x-axis or y equals zero is still going to be the excluded value. And let's look at this example for more information. So we're finding the domain and range of r of x, which is equal to, I'm gonna rewrite it, one over two x plus five. The domain is the easier value to find. It's where the denominator is not equal to zero. So two x plus five cannot equal zero. Two x cannot equal negative five x cannot equal negative 5 halves. So therefore, which is the same thing as negative 2 and a half or negative 2.5. So here's x equals negative 2 and a half or negative 5 halves. It's this vertical asymptote that we have there. And now because the degree of our pollen of our rational function is greater in the denominator, we're going to still have that horizontal asymptote being the x-axis. So y cannot equal zero. Therefore, the domain will be all real numbers minus negative two and a half or negative five halves. You could write it either way. And the range will be all real numbers with the exception of zero. And here's again the answer to this problem. They did end up getting the same domain and range that we did, but what they did instead of just setting the denominator equal to zero and solving it was they also realized that because there's a coefficient in front of x in the denominator, that means we're gonna have a vertical shrink towards the x-axis. So they factored out a one-half. And when you factor out the two from both terms in the denominator, you get two in front and then x minus two and a half. And then if you set x minus two and a half equal to zero, you still get the same asymptote of negative five halves or negative two and a half. So this method also reveals that we have a vertical shrink towards the x-axis and we're having a horizontal translation to the left, two and a half units. Here's another approach to help us find a horizontal asymptote if one exists. Recall from algebra, especially algebra two, how to find a horizontal asymptote or capital H, capital A as an abbreviation. If the degree of the numerator in a rational function is greater than the degree of the denominator, there will be no horizontal asymptote. Actually, in fact, there's gonna be a slant asymptote and we're gonna talk about how to find that a little later on. But for now, if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, there's no horizontal asymptote at all. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then you are always going to have a horizontal asymptote of the x-axis or y equals zero. And that was actually what we saw in the previous example. The third one is that if the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. And here's an example of number three. R of x is equal to three x minus six over two x minus four. We know that the vertical asymptote is gonna happen where the denominator is equal to zero. So if we set that two x plus four not equal to zero and solve, we'll get that two x cannot equal negative four so therefore x cannot equal negative two. That represents the piece that we are excluding from our domain, as well as the vertical asymptote that exists in our graph. And now for the horizontal asymptote, we see that we have x to the first over x to the first as the leading exponents. So when we set up the ratio of three x over 2x, the x's cancel out, and we have 3 halves left, 
So that is going to be our horizontal asymptote and the excluded value within our range. So the range for r of x is all real numbers excluding 3 halves or 1 and a half. Now let's go over some definitions. Given a rational function r in the form of r of x, which is equal to p of x divided by q of x, the x-intercepts of r are those real z values where p of z is equal to 0 and q of z is not equal to 0 because if q of x is equal to 0, it would be undefined. And if both p of z and q of z would equal 0, you would have a whole. So in other words, x-intercepts occur where the numerator is equal to 0 and the denominator is not equal to 0. The y-intercept of r of x is the ratio given by p of 0 divided by q of 0, provided that q of 0 is not 0. So when you substitute 0 in for x in the numerator and denominator, whatever those functions individually simplify to, p of 0 and q of 0 respectfully, when you divide those two, that will give you the y-intercept. And again, q of 0 cannot be equal to 0 at that point, otherwise you would have a point that does not exist. And it's also worth noting that not all rational functions have intercepts. Some will have x-intercepts, but no y-intercepts. Some will have no, no x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Let's see how by going over some examples. What are the x and y-intercepts of each rational function? Well, to begin, let's factor both the numerator and denominator to see if that can help us especially with the x-intercepts, because the x-intercepts happen where the numerator is equal to 0. So we can factor a common 3 out, and we're left with x squared minus 1. In the denominator, we can factor out a 2, and we're left with x plus 2. And we can factor x squared minus 1 to be x plus 1, x minus 1. And now the denominator is already fully factored, so let's just rewrite it, x plus 2. All right, so the x-intercepts occur when x is equal to negative 1 and positive 1. So the x-intercepts in this set are negative 1, 0, and 1, 0. And now the y-intercept in this case is going to happen when we substitute 0 in for x. So we'll end up having... So if I substitute a 0 in there, there, and there, and then evaluate, we have 3 times 1 times negative 1. So I have a negative 3. And then the denominator, I have 2 times 2, which is 4. And its x-coordinate for the y-intercept is 0. Now let's look at our second example on this slide. Again, we're going to begin by factoring both the numerator and denominator. So 3x plus 12 has a 3 that can be pulled out and we're left with x plus 4. And then the denominator, 2x plus 8, they're both even so we can pull a 2 out and we're left with x plus 4. Notice we have these two common factors of x plus 4 in both the numerator and denominator. And remember that will produce a whole or a removable discontinuity. So this function is equal to 3 halves such that our x value is not equal to negative 4. And now can the numerator ever equal 0? No. So therefore there are no x-intercepts. If we substitute 0 in for x, we're still going to get 3 halves. So the y-intercept for this one it's going to be 0, 3 halves, or 0, 1 and a half. So what this rational function will actually look like is a straight line at y equals 3 halves, and it will have a hole at x equals negative 4 because of that removable discontinuity. Now let's look at the last one. So we have 5x squared plus 5. We can factor out a common 5 there, and we're left with x squared plus 1. And in the denominator, we can't really factor anything out, so we'll just leave it in the same form. Now remember, x-intercepts occur when the numerator is equal to 0, and assuming the denominator does not. Let's first set 
our numerator equal to zero, x squared plus one. And then if we solve, we'll end up getting x squared is equal to negative one. And then if we square root both sides, we'll get that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative one or i. So therefore there are no x-intercepts, no x-intercepts. Okay, and now for the y-intercept, we can substitute zero in. So we'll have five times one, which is five. And then if we substitute zero in here, two times zero is zero, and zero plus one is one. So our y-intercept is zero, five. Let's pull the answer tab out and see. Yep, we did get both of these in the first one and negative three-fourths for the y-intercept. Again, in problem B, the only intercept we have is the y-intercept, zero, three-halves. And in C, again, we have no x-intercepts, but the y-intercept is zero, five.